Hey, everyone. Uh, I had one too many coffees, so if the room starts shaking, it's just my body vibrating the fabric of reality. Uh, that's what I'm feeling right now. Uh, I'm here to talk about supercharging your GraphQL development. Uh, there's a lot of tools in this space, and I think it's a really, really interesting uh, topic to cover. Uh, I know that I am the one last thing between you and lunch, so I'm actually going to supercharge this talk. Uh, if you want to bring out your cameras, I'm going to show you a slide while I introduce myself. So my name is John. That's a picture of me. I don't know if you can tell the resemblance here, but I work at a company called Coursera. It's an education company. Uh, I, hope, I hope you've heard of it before, but I work on the front end infrastructure team, and I think a lot about the tools and workflows and practices, and make sure you get those cameras out, because the next slide is the important one. Um, it's, it's a great place to work. Um, here's the slide. Guess what? Supercharged. Uh, I'm going to talk about three big tools. One is GraphQL CLI. Second is ESLint plugin GraphQL. And the third is Apollo CoGen. That's the end of my talk. I'm just kidding. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why these tools are really useful for, uh, for everyone here. Uh, these are things that you could probably start downloading on your Wi-Fi right now. Uh, the first one here is GraphQL CLI. This has evolved a ton in the last year since uh, the last time I gave this talk. And it's a really good tool for all the things that you need to use and do with your GraphQL schemas, uh, querying your GraphQL endpoints, um, things like that. It uses something that's really nice. And you might not have seen this before, but this is a .graphql config file. And in this file, it's going to capture all the information that you need around different things like your endpoints in, in development or in production. It also has a lot of configuration here for tooling. And this is the really important part, is that this one file is going to help supply information for all of the tooling that you have in your dev environment. So the, here are some of the basics uh, of using GraphQL CLI. GraphQL get schema, does what you think it's going to do. It's going to get a schema. It can retrieve it from your development server or from your production server, uh, depending on what environment you set. Uh, you can check to see the schema status. Is your schema out of date compared to the remote one that you have to download again? Uh, you can also diff things, too. So if you're de developing on a, uh, a new schema or something like that, and you kind of want to see what are the differences, if there's uh, backwards incompatible changes or not, uh, you can use GraphQL diff. I realize now that I had 10 minutes, and I, I have an eight-minute talk, so I'm going to slow down a little bit and let the caffeine diffuse through my body. Um, GraphQL CLI is actually really useful, too, when you're exploring other people's projects. So because it uses GraphQL config, if you jump into a project or a folder or a repository that has a .graphql config file, you can actually just run a command to get access to that GraphQL endpoint. So here, there's nothing else in this folder except for a .graphql config file. We're going to go ahead and show that, OK, here's an extension point. Here's the Star Wars API. I run GraphQL Playground. And it's going to go ahead and run the web server and do all that stuff and allow us to access that API with all that configuration. Um, and you don't need to go through the work of setting up a graphical server, uh, Express thing, however you've seen it in a tutorial. And this is a really good way to encapsulate how to access a particular GraphQL API. Great. Next one, ESLint plugin GraphQL. Uh, this is important because you want to write queries that are actually valid. Um, and it does this in a few different ways. One is that if you're writing JavaScript, you're probably already using ESLint, and you're probably already putting GraphQL queries inside of your JavaScript. So it's a natural place to start validating those things. Um, here's a, a video of like doing a silly thing where I'm going to go ahead and try and get a field called foo ID. I don't know why I would do this because it doesn't exist. So it tells you right there that it doesn't exist, and it also fits your whole linting flow. Um, we'll talk more about this later. So here's a few different rules that I think are really valuable inside of ESLint uh, plugin GraphQL. One is the basic one is template strings. Just checking, does this validate against a schema? It's important to note that this is going to validate against your local schema, but this is a nice way to just make sure to sanity check that you're actually writing val you know, valid queries. The other things here are housekeeping. So when you write operations, sometimes you want to enforce that those operations are named. And that's really useful for deb debugging purposes. So there's a rule called named operations. Same with required fields. There's a lot of times where you have a client that needs particular fields, like the ID, in order to cache. And so you can say for any particular field that has ID, the ID field, you can say, I'm, you should always be requesting this thing. Um, and 
this goes really well with the first tool, GraphQL CLI. GraphQL CLI has a linter inside of it as well. Uh, so if you use ESLint and GraphQL lint, you can lint both your schemas and your queries at the same time and make sure that everything is valid before you send it to production. My third tool, Apollo CodeGen. Uh, I've, this is a really interesting one. We've heard a lot about code generation uh, before, um, but this is like a, Apollo CodeGen is a really good tool for JavaScript developers, for client developers on mobile as well, because what it does is it takes uh, our GraphQL queries and generates them into useful types. Um, in some clients, it might generate into classes. Uh, whatever it is, it allows you to access GraphQL in the way that that particular uh, environment thinks is the best way to do it. So here, here's an example. I have at the top here a GraphQL query where I'm grabbing some information. Um, let me just pause this right here. And uh, I'm actually trying to access an element on this. So if you look right in the middle where it says props, you'll see that I'm using flow. And with flow, I'm saying, I have a GraphQL response that is, uh, is a memberships query. That's the query that is above it. And I'm trying to access a particular property, user ID. Well, guess what? I'm not actually getting that from GraphQL, so how is this supposed to have a user ID? So of course, Flow is going to complain, saying, hey, you know, user ID doesn't exist on this object type. Uh, you're doing something silly. You shouldn't do this. Um, and that's great. You want the, the tools to tell you how to make things better. So the first thing that you can go and just say, you know what? I'm going to go add this to the GraphQL query that's right here. And Flow is going to immediately, uh, uh, sorry, Apollo CodeGen is going to go ahead and generate a new flow type. On the element itself, we'll see that the, the, it has a property user ID. And if we reset the state a little bit here, it won't complain about that thing that you accessed. That's really important. Um, it's really easy to, especially when you're used to using REST things, to just access things willy nilly, even if they don't exist. Um, and the important piece of this, and I don't know what this is, OK. Um, the important part about this is that. Your, your types can now flow all the way from your back end all the way to your clients. And this is powerful. So if you're using gRPC or Thrift or some custom type thingy, you can code generate that into GraphQL. You can use Apollo Go code gen to take the GraphQL and code gen that into TypeScript or Flow. And that way, you can ensure that your clients are using these, this data and these types the way that they were intended to all the way from the source. This is really powerful and makes development a lot simpler. Guess what? GraphQL CLI can do this too. So if you go to your GraphQL config file, you can actually add some information about code gen. And these are all the, the uh, options that you would otherwise pass to Apollo code gen. Uh, and that way, you can just say GraphQL code gen, uh, and then it will generate your bindings for you into the particular places. This is really powerful and allows you to keep all of your information in the same place. So. Good thing I have more time, because I have a whole set of things that I want to ask for from this community. Because these tools are good, but I think they could be a lot better. Uh, so this is also subtitled uh, my wish list. So the first is GraphQL modules. Uh, so the idea of being able to Im explicitly import things or export things from GraphQL files is really, really interesting. Because now, instead of just like blindly concatenating strings and in, in different files together, we can actually say, I only want this particular type from here. I want this particular type from here. Um, and that allows us to do things like you could package up your types. Maybe you have special types for your API, and you can send that off to somebody else. Um, if you look at the GraphQL import package, they do this using uh, comments. Um, and the loaders and stuff will understand how to parse that out and pull everything together. But the more that we can explicitly say what exactly we need in order for this schema to be valid, the better that our tooling can be to, uh, to, to, to validate this kind of uh, uh, concatenation of these large graphs. The second is supplementing development with runtime analysis. We have a lot of like, we had this like cool formal proof of how queries work and result costs. Um, we know based on uh, runtime cost of particular GraphQL queries, what every field is going to do in terms of how much time it's going to add. I would love to be able to see as like a little note here is you just added the instructors thing. This is going to cost you this much more. Maybe you should separate this into a different query, or maybe this doesn't need to be here at the beginning. Uh, we have all this information. We know where all of it's being used. We can put all this information in the development environment. The, the last thing that I want to ask for is language agnostic tooling. I talked to you just now about two pieces, like uh, ESLint and Apollo Cogen. Uh, Apollo Cogen does do different platforms, but ESLint is a very JavaScript thing. 
But the thing that I'm doing is not JavaScript related, it's GraphQL related. So we really want to make sure to welcome everybody here that's not from JavaScript uh, and give them the tooling that we are experiencing in JavaScript to help validate their queries and make writing schemas a lot uh, simpler. Uh, in fact, I brought this up, and it turns out that uh, Divyendu and, and, the, and the folks at Prisma actually just released VS Code GraphQL. Um, and this is kind of language agnostic. It's not editor agnostic. But if you look at this extension, it gives you uh, a lot of really nice things that you might see in something like Graphical. It uses the GraphQL language service under the hood. They've done a lot of contrib contributions there. allows you to jump to certain definitions. I think it takes advantage of the imports. Um, it even allows you to do autocomplete within your GraphQL tag so that uh, you know, it's, you're just doing basically graphical interface, but inside of your JavaScript. That's all I have. Thank you. So good.